Hello everyone and welcome to part three of our online lecture series relating to the topic of alkenes. In this video, we're going to look at what happens when hydrogen halides are added to the alkene molecule. This means we're going to have to consider the electrophilic addition mechanism once again, and this time we're going to have to look at carbocation stability following Markovnikov's rule. I'll also be looking in this video at what happens when steam is added in the presence of an acid catalyst to the alkene, and we'll take a look at addition polymerization. Check the timestamps in the video description to go straight to any of those topics right now. Otherwise, let's get started. Hi there everybody and welcome back. In this video we're going to finish off our journey with the alkenes and we're going to start by looking at another addition reaction of the alkenes. This time it's with a hydrogen halide. If you are following the notes from college and it's the original set of these notes, then there are actually two little typos just here if you could change those for me please. You'll see here that we're describing that an alkene is actually meant to be reacting with our hydrogen halide, as I just described. And this time our product is not a dihaloalkane, it's just a haloalkane. So if you could change that for me, that'd be great. So what are we actually seeing here then? Well, this time our alkene is going to react with the HX and one of the two carbons from the double bond gets the H and the other gets the X. And so this time it isn't just a case of chucking two of the same atom on and then ending up with the same product every single time and not having to worry about it. This time we've got to think carefully. Where does the H go and where does the X go? Exam questions will often lead you and guide you into putting the X in a particular location. This could be done by showing you what it then reacts further to become. Or they could give you the name of the product that they want you to have. They may also discuss something called major or minor with the proportion of which product they wish you to create. I'll explain what that is shortly. So let's have a look at this in action and see where it's relevant to consider where the X and where the H goes and when we don't need to worry too much. Now our first example here is our most straightforward we can get for our alkenes, it's ethene. And you can see here ethene is reacting with hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid, if you will. And we can see that the ethene here is a symmetrical alkene. Whenever our alkene is symmetrical, we won't have to worry about where the H goes or where the Cl goes, because the product will only be the same thing but flipped over, depending on where we decide to put it. So we don't need to worry, just to sum that up, if our alkene is symmetrical, where each of these two atoms from our soon-to-be electrophile ends up. However, if our alkene is non-symmetrical, then we do have to take our time a little bit more. Let's have a look at the second example, which will outline that for us. In the second example, we can see propene, and I've written it out in two separate equations, so we can see everything that's going on side by side. Propene is reacting with HBr. Now, when propene reacts with HBr, because propene is not a symmetrical alkene, We've got to make a decision on where does the bromine end up, on the first or on the second carbon. For example, this top line here shows me putting the bromine onto the second carbon along in the chain, which was the second carbon along from the original alkene. That gives me two bromopropane as a product. Here in this example, I've put the bromine on the first carbon, giving me one bromopropane. And actually then, following up from our general knowledge of organic chemistry, we can describe the relationship between these two structures as structural isomers, which means they have the same molecular formula, all the same carbons, hydrogens and bromine, but they have different structural formula, as we can see here, and emphasised by their different IUPAC names. Another example with a different asymmetrical alkene is butuanine just here. Now, if I was using butuene, which would have had the double bond in the middle here between the second and third carbons, I wouldn't actually have to worry about any difference in the two possible products because there would only be one possible product. It would just be the two iodobutane. However, here, because I've got butuene, what I need to be careful of is when I put on the hydrogen iodide, I've got to make a decision on where the iodine is going to go, and I can end up with these two possible structural isomer products. Now you may be asked by the exam question as well to make a particular product 
and outline a mechanism to make that particular product. Well, our mechanism is exactly the same mechanism as we have seen before with our alkenes. It's electrophilic addition. It's just this time, the electrophile is a little different. Let's have a look at that. All right, so let's outline the electrophilic addition mechanism for our alkene with the hydrogen halide. Now, this time, first big difference is gonna be, and you can see it highlighted in pink just here, the hydrogen halide is going to be our electrophile this time. But same as last time, and again, this is a landscape page, so I will show this fully under the camera so you can see everything that's going on. It's the same general outline as last time. We're gonna make an intermediate, but as it points out here, we're going to use a different electrophile and our electrophile is HX instead of the X2. So last time we saw something like BR2 or CL2 acting as the electrophile and it didn't have a dipole and then it ended up with that dipole being induced by the uh, double bond between the two carbons. This time our electrophile is different and we don't need to consider that the dipole would have to be induced because since this molecule is naturally polar, with a delta plus on the hydrogen and a delta minus on the X due to the electronegativity of the halogens, I don't need to worry about inducing that dipole at all. It's already present. It's a permanent dipole. Now our first curly arrow is the same as last time. We reach out from the double bond and show the movement of a pair of electrons from the alkene using this curly arrow. And it must go in this direction. It must show the direction the electron pair goes. And same as last time, it goes to the delta positive out of the two in our electrophile. So our electrophile here is acting like all electrophiles should, and it's accepting a pair of electrons. And that's what it is by definition, remember, an electron pair acceptor. Then heterolytically, we break this bond onto the X. Now our intermediate is what's really important this time. We have to be careful where we put the positive charge we have to be careful what carbocation we decide to build here. Because wherever we put the carbon with the positive charge out of the two carbons that were in the original alkene, that carbon is going to be the one that picks up the X at this stage. So you might need to look ahead to the final product to see the location of where the X is and make sure you create the correct one. Not all carbocations were created equally also. Some of them are more stable than others. And so this is where the exam question might take a major versus minor direction. And I'll explain more about that shortly. I just want to get through the outline of the initial electrophilic addition mechanism here. As we can see then we have a carbocation, which we have selected carefully based on our intended destination of the X. And here, lone pair, negative charge. We attack just here to the carbon with the positive charge going straight up in the face of the carbon here. And then we show our final product, which is our haloalkane. And you can see throughout here, if I just nudge that down a little bit, you can see nice consistent image here of our mechanism and you can track the H and the X all the way through. Now I did mention just then something about a difference in the stability of our carbocations. Well, that's what we're going to consider next, and it's called Markovnikov's Rule. So one of the big worries when we're looking at alkenes reacting with the hydrogen halide is, what is Markovnikov's Rule and how do I use it to decide which of my final products I may need to create if my alkene is non-symmetrical? Well, if we have to consider Markovnikov's Rule, we need to think of these three separate structures to help us realise what's going on. Here I've got a primary, secondary, and tertiary carbocation. So you can see here in each of these examples, the carbon is bonded three times. And this time we can see in our primary, one to the rest of the chain and two H's. Secondary, two rest of the chain and one H. And then over here for our tertiary, I've got three direct bonds to other carbon atoms, and I've got absolutely no direct bonds to H's from the carbon with the positive charge. As you can see here with this arrow, this tertiary one is the most stable out of the three. So the fewer direct bonds to hydrogens and the more direct bonds to other carbons that my carbocation has, the more stable it is. Now, if when I'm doing my mechanism, I have to make a decision about where the carbocation goes, what I can tell you is, according to Markovnikov's rule, 
A majority of the time, and this is where that term major or minor comes up, a majority of the time, the direction will go where the more stable carbocation is used as the intermediate. And so if we have to decide between two different directions and two different positions of the carbocation, then we will tend to go in the direction a majority of the time, which gives us the more stable carbocation intermediate. The other direction would be described as the minor product, and so that's going to be our less stable carbocation intermediate route. Let's have a look at Markovnikov's rule in action. So here, for instance, I've got propene and it's reacting with hydrogen bromide. Now, one of the options for the products when hydrogen bromide reacts with propene is 2-bromopropane. And we can see here in the electrophilic addition mechanism, in order to put the bromine on the second carbon along in the chain, I've had to make the second carbon the one that ends up with the positive charge and only three bonds in my intermediate. So I've chosen to make the second carbon along in the chain the carbocation. Now, if we look at the structure of this intermediate, we can see that the carbon with the positive charge is bonded to one, two other carbons directly, and one hydrogen, making this intermediate a secondary carbocation. The bromine then attacks in the usual way, and my product, 2-bromopropane, is shown clearly. Now, I'll come back to this mechanism in a moment, but let's have a look at the exact alternative. Now, the exact alternative of this would be to have hydrogen bromide react with the propene to make one bromopropane, with the bromine right over here at the start of the chain. Studying the mechanism, which starts out, notice, in exactly the same way, no difference there at all. Maybe just my handwriting. But our intermediate is where things are really different. Because I want the bromine to go here at the end of the chain, I've got to make this carbon, the first one in the chain, the one with the positive charge. So what kind of carbocation is this? The carbon is directly bonded to one, two H's this time, and one other carbon directly. So that means this is a primary carbocation and produces that one bromopropane product. So how does Markovnikov's rule enhance this picture? Well, Markovnikov's rule tells me that this process at the top is my major direction. When the propene has to make the decision to react with the HBr to become either of these two bromine-containing products, it's gonna go this way a majority of the time because this carbocation, this secondary one, is more stable than this primary one. And so here, the 2-bromopropane is a majority of the final mixture. I would still have some 1-bromopropane in there, but this would be a majority of the final mixture. Major product, minor product. Some people make a mistake when they talk about this in the exam, and they say that the reason that this is the major is because it is more stable. That's not true at all. It's to do with the fact that this intermediate used to make it was more stable than the alternative primary carbocation intermediate that gets used to make the one bromopropane. You've got to be really clear that you understand it's about carbocation stability, not product stability, but the two are linked together. Our final addition reaction of the alkenes is with steam in the presence of an acid catalyst. So H3PO4 or H2SO4 is okay as well. This would actually occur around 300 degrees C and we take our alkene and we react it with H2O. Now, when the H2O reacts, you need to think about that molecule of water as splitting up with the OH going one way and the H going the other because one of these carbons is gonna pick up the OH and the other is gonna pick up the hydrogen. So here you can see in this possible product, the OH went to the carbon on the right and the H went to the carbon on the left. But if this R group was another length of the chain, then they could have gone to the other carbons. Now, what that means is if our alkene is symmetrical, we only get one possible product. But if our alkene is non-symmetrical, then we're going to end up with structural isomerism again in the products. 
This time, however, there is no mechanism to support this reaction, although they do occasionally refer to the two different structural isomer products in the exam as major or minor. So whilst we might not need to outline the mechanism for this reaction at all, we do need to think about it a little bit and how it would appear so that we can answer questions like that. Let's have a look at some reactions where this is and isn't an issue. So we can see here on the page right now, we've got our first ethene example, nice and straightforward, reacting with H2O. And I've shown this in full display so you can get a real picture of this new functional group, the alcohol functional group there. And we can see that one of the carbons picked up the hydrogen and the other carbon picked up the full OH, creating ethanol. Now, because this was a symmetrical and very, very simple alkene, we didn't need to worry about there being two different structural isomer products over here. But it wouldn't be chemistry if it didn't get more complicated every now and again. We can see that happen here when propene reacts. Two separate reactions, both with steam, both in the presence of an acid catalyst. However, you can see here we've got two different possible products. With the OH going on the second carbon along, or the first carbon in the chain, giving us propan-2-ol and propan-1-ol respectively. So both of these are alcohol products. Now they are structural isomers of each other, and even though we don't need to outline the mechanism for this, because we can see the location of the final functional group, our OH, we could assume that this one, for instance, would be created from a secondary carbocation. And because this OH is at the end of the chain over here, we could assume that this one would be created from a primary carbocation. That means we can describe this as the major product and this as the minor product, following our knowledge of Markovnikov's rule from the previous hydrogen halide and alkene example. Our final part of the alkenes topic to consider is addition polymerization. Now for addition polymerization, we're looking at creating non-biodegradable polymers. Our reaction is very simple. We've got our alkene here with four substituent groups all the way around, which could all be H's or some H's and some halogens or whatever it needs to be. And this is referred to as our monomer. So the monomer contains the alkene double bond and we would have a number of it. When this polymerizes, what happens is, think of the one, two, three, and four as pushing up and below like this, and the double bond reaching out in both directions, making a daisy chain of one repeating unit after another. We now put the brackets around it, although they aren't crucial at A level, and an N on the outside, which describes the relationship between the before and the after. You've got to be really careful that when you draw the repeating unit, if you have a single repeating unit drawn in the exam, that you only put two carbons in the line between the brackets. Any other carbons that perhaps were part of these uh, first, second, third or fourth groups around here would actually come off the major structure here and they would be now appearing as branches. I see a lot of people take something like propene and end up putting three carbons in a line when actually it would be two in a line and a branch. Let's have a look at some actual examples, which I've just realized does actually include the propene one, so that's quite good. Here you can see we've got chloroethene, and when this polymerizes, we push the groups above and below, and this is our repeating unit. In this propene example, the one I mentioned a moment ago, you can see here, and I've color coded this so you can see the positioning of everything, we've got the two carbons from the double bond, and here, this was the rest of the chain, it now gets chucked off as a branch. And this is an example of a single repeating unit, both of them are. Sometimes in the exam, they ask you to draw two repeat units together, and so you would just copy paste right alongside this, all of it inside one set of brackets. However, a nice rule for the alkenes to follow is there will only ever be two carbons shown in the line between the brackets for a single repeating unit. And so that's something you can really take home. That's it for part three of our online lecture series for alkenes. Click the links on screen now or click the eye at the top of this screen to be taken to other related videos on alkenes and module four organic chemistry. Until next time, happy revising.